the, the big thing for me, if anybody watching this thinks about doing something entrepreneurial, you know, setting a plan, um, you know, being smart about that plan, but it's, again, taking that first leap, buy that first four unit deal, buy that first eight unit deal, you probably will not have all the answers. You might have to go hard on a deposit that's very meaningful and you might not have your equity and your debt, everything perfectly lined up, but don't let that dissuade you. I think I see a lot of people who uh, talk a lot about it, but don't necessarily do a lot about it and don't take that first step. And if I could give any advice, it's, it's go out and, and do your research and do your homework, but then at some point you're gonna have to you know, take that leap. Hey everyone, today I have a good friend of mine, John Drachman with us today with the Waterford Property Company. Really excited to have you today, John. I've been waiting for uh, us to get together and, and talk about yeah, real estate. excited. No, yeah. thank you so much. No problem, my pleasure. So John has had, him and his partner, Sean Rawson, mm -hmm. have had a tremendous level of success in relatively a short period of time. You co-founded Waterford Property Company back in 2014? 2014, correct. And since then you've acquired a few billion dollars of apartment real estate. We've, uh, I think we just passed uh, two, or $2.4 billion with the multifamily assets that we've done. Wow, yeah. I, mean, I definitely want to dive in on that, but before we go into it, if you can share a little bit about yourself, mm -hmm. some background on you and Waterford. Yeah, so it's actually pretty interesting how I got into the multifamily business. I actually started my career um, at Grubb & Ellis as an office and industrial leasing broker. Uh, was there for uh, about four and a half years, uh, and then wanted to make the transition to the principal side of the business. So I actually went back to graduate school at USC, where I got my MBA and my master's in real estate development degrees. Uh, back in uh, 2000, I graduated in 2009, uh, which was a tremendous time to be getting into the, uh, uh, back into the real estate business. Uh, and uh, I was very fortunate at the end of 2009, after about seven months of uh, really painstaking work to find a job, uh, to land a job with a firm uh, called Greenlaw Partners. And Greenlaw Partners is one of the more active office and industrial uh, investors, uh, you know, at the time in Southern California, really now on the West Coast. Uh, and I joined them right when the last, uh, sort of the, the bottom of the last market was. So that was December of 2009. I worked there for five years, uh, had a great run and experience of working on value add commercial transactions, everything from acquisitions to asset management to dispositions. Uh, we were very active in the marketplaces back then and uh, was able to see sort of soup to nuts, uh, the principal side of the business, raising capital, finding assets, underwriting them, asset managing them, turning them around and selling them. Um, but I always had an itch to uh, be on my own and be an entrepreneur. Um, I got that itch when I was a broker working for myself. And so back in um, 2014, uh, I made the decision to leave Greenlaw Partners and start my own firm. And at the time, uh, one of my close friends uh, was my now business partner, Sean Rawson. And he was off on his own and he comes from a residential development and entitlement background. And literally we had lunch and I told him uh, I was gonna go off on my own. And we started talking about office space. And I said, you know, where are you officing? And he said that he was in an executive suite. I said, I had found this small office. I needed somebody to share it with me. And we made a decision at that lunch in very quick order uh, to uh, lease an office space together. So we leased a little 850 square foot uh, office space in Irvine in the airport area. And that was August 1st of 2014. Uh, and it's, uh, we didn't start off as business partners, but about uh, 11 months in is when we closed our first multifamily acquisition together, which was a 14 unit project off uh, Second Street uh, and Ocean and PCH. Uh, and then um, away we went. So that was your first acquisition. That wasn't that long ago on the multifamily. No, on the multifamily side. side, correct. That was 14 units. I think you paid 2.8 million. You paid 200 grand a door. Yeah. 200 a door, and that was. Which, by the way, at the yeah. time, people said we were overpaying, and uh, which is crazy when you think about the markets now. Uh, but yeah, we bought that off market. We had to raise a million dollars of capital. Uh, we went to eff effectively four investors to raise the majority of that. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, uh, we, we had a belief that uh, there was opportunity to buy what we would call, specifically in Long Beach, sub-institutional multifamily assets that were really C properties and bring them to B plus. Right. Because we saw the growth of the class A properties in downtown and they were doing very well. Mm -hmm. We saw all these properties that were 
you know, built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s that hadn't had a lot of capital invested in them. And we felt, especially if we, you know, cleaned up the in-unit living experience of those units, modernized them, um, added some common area features that we could charge premium rents over what they were currently getting. And that was the business plan. And we were fortunate that we had um, four investors who trusted us with that and took a chance with us. And um, we bought that project and away we went. Well, one thing that I've noticed and a number of brokers noticed yeah. in the marketplace is that that was your first deal. You went on to do your second, third, fourth, fifth, and rents to repeat in that market. Yeah. You were always able to get above market rents. Yep. You were pioneering rents that weren't even yep. other, practically no other owners were getting within yep. the marketplace. Yep. How were you doing it? Were you were you just going on a deeper level reno or was there just untapped potential within the market that you guys were just achieving? I, I think it was untapped potential in the market. So I think we always are trying to think ahead. I mean, being a you know smaller entrepreneurial firm, I think we've always viewed things that you have to think 10 steps forward because there's a number of our competitors who are very well healed, who are you know very successful at doing what they're doing. So we have to do things differently. And I think what we saw with Long Beach is nobody was doing really deep value add meaning really spending significant capital on the unit turns, right? I think that first project we spent $35,000 per unit, both on interior and exterior work, which at the time uh, was incredibly high. Uh, some of the contractors we talked to about what we expected and want to do said, you don't need to spend this much money. And our belief was if we spend this money, we will get the credit from tenants and we will get higher rents than people have thought. Um, I remember the story of that first uh, 1275 East Second Street asset where we renovated our first unit. We did an above standard, what many thought was an above standard unit turn. Mm. And we thought we could get 1450 and we put it on the market for 1595. And Sean called me on a Sunday about four o'clock and he said, you'll never believe this. A tenant showed up and took our asking rent at 1595. Wow. And we thought, oh my gosh, this works. And then I think we literally tied up the 220 unit projects across the street because we thought, okay, we're onto something. But I think what our belief was is we were doing unit turns that the market wasn't seeing. Really full, full everything. Um, and, and being really mindful too of the common areas, repainting projects, adding you know, better amenities, adding uh, you know, really nice outdoor barbecues, thinking about the windows and the doors, and just really trying to be really mindful of uh, creating a really high quality uh, living experience. Um, and I think a lot of our competition was doing very sort of minor upkeeps. Right. Uh, and that was sort of the differentiating factor there. Yeah. I mean, going through your buildings, your buildings would stand out. Within the mm -hmm. market. You could drive by and look and say, okay, that's probably a Waterford building. Yep. You know, smooth stucco, giving it a new look, a yep. good vibe. Like yep. The entire package yep. was done right. Yep. So that was definitely something that really wasn't in the marketplace. No. And then how did you scale that? Were you, did you just take those four investors on your first deal yeah. and just rinse and repeat and they kept going with you, adding more cash and you just kept it going? We, we did it first. I, I think it was, so on the investor front, I think we did with those uh, same investors, I want to say, I think we did our first four or five projects with them. Um, and then they got a little like, wow, we've done a lot. Let's, we've got to sell some of these assets. And then it was a little bit of a, you know, leveraging our personal relationships uh, to connect with other investors uh, that were seeing what we were doing. Um, and I always would tell you that it feels like the first one to three projects are really hard. Mm -hmm. Getting brokers to trust you, getting sellers to trust you, getting investors to trust you. Once you can build a track record and once we had units that were turned showing rents, it got easier to bring new investors in. Uh, it got easier to uh, show our vision, uh, and then I think there's a there's what we would I would call the you know Warren Buffett would call it the snowball effect, right. where things can get easier, um, and so it was just really leveraging relationships to meet new investors, um, and um, you know it just kind of it, it kind of morphed from there. Yeah, and, and that went on for at least from 2015 yep. to at least 2020. Yeah, we we bought our last value add project in. Long Beach was probably 2019. I see. Um, because what ended up happening specific to Long Beach was we started having a lot of imitators. And I think people recognized once they saw us buying projects, rehabbing, and, and then they saw the sales prices we were getting, which were setting record numbers, we had a number of groups come in to that area uh, and try to compete with us. And we just you know, s saw what you're seeing throughout Southern California as prices were rising. And it was right. getting harder. Um, 
harder to do that program. Got it. Now, that brings us up to about beginning of January 2020. I remember mm -hmm. Sean and I, your partner, mm -hmm. we toured a 20-unit apartment building in Anaheim together. Yes. COVID hit. Yes. Changed the market a little bit. Yes. But then fast forwarding into COVID, you've transformed Waterford, you and Sean both, mm -hmm. from the value add investment group mm -hmm. into going into this institutional mm -hmm. space. And just from looking back, that 20 unit wasn't too long ago. Yeah. You went in and bought how many Class A apartment buildings in Southern California? Uh, we bought 13 projects this year, uh, almost 4,000 units. Um, and we'll, yeah, it's a little over $2 billion worth of acquisitions. So I, I think it's, you know, everybody knew you guys were mm -hmm. something special. Mm -hmm. Your reputation, mm -hmm. I mean, is, is best, as good mm -hmm. as it gets. Mm -hmm. So everybody knew you were going to take off and do mm -hmm. something great, but I, it was just happened so quick. Yeah, well it has, like yeah. So talk to us about that transformation where it went from, you know, looking at 20, 30 unit apartment buildings mm -hmm. to, you know, you're buying a class A apartment building in Glendale, that's yep. 500 units. Yep. Talk to us about this program, how it all kind of came together. Yeah, it's interesting. I think both Sean and I, where we're more, uh, where our experience is interesting is that we both came from institutional backgrounds. So both with Sean's institutional development background, you know, m me um, working at Greenlaw Partners, you know, we had a lot of institutional equity partners that we did business with. Um, and when we were growing our multifamily business, we were still working on land entitlement projects that were quite large. Sean entitled the largest project in uh, LA County in 2019 in the city of Pomona. He entitled the largest project in Orange County in Santa Ana in 2020. Um, I was working on large scale, you know, commercial repositioning projects, value add projects with institutional partners. So we had this institutional background. And really, the, when the pandemic hit, we recognized that, you know, we had to retool our company, right? Because I think like most everyone, you know, that came out of left field. And, you know, we weren't um, necessarily prepared for a worldwide pandemic. And um, you know, me being locked in my house for two months and all those sort of funny things, right? Yeah. And, and all those interesting things that we've all dealt with. And I think we really used it as an opportunity to say, okay, what's Waterford 2.0 going to be? Um, you know, our commercial background, um, you know, on the office side, you know, we've really seen a massive change there and a dislocation going, I don't think office is where we want to be spending a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually bought two value-add retail projects uh, since the pandemic started, believing that the dislocations in retail will lead to opportunity. So we're actually pretty bullish on that sector because we think there's a lot of redevelopment opportunities as far as retail is concerned. But Sean, um, you know, really to his credit, um, he found out about a program, what we would call the essential housing or workforce housing space with a really interesting financing mechanism to buy, you know, large scale multifamily assets and convert them to be targeted towards people who make between 60 and 120% of AMI through um, allowing cities to give us a tax, uh, a basically a tax exemption, a property tax exemption that then allows us to go sell tax-free municipal bonds to acquire projects. Um, so we're able to lower our operating expenses, have a cheaper cost of capital, which allows us to deed restrict and lower rents. Um, and Sean found out about this program. And really because of COVID, um, it, we had the time and he had the time to go explore it. So I, I'll never forget, he literally called me in April uh, and we were talking every day and he said, hey, I, I heard about this program, this group up in Northern California acquired a couple projects. I think there's a really interesting financing program and I'm gonna go spend, you know, I need to spend some time really focused on it. I told him, I said, I'll handle the asset management of our existing portfolio. Um, you know, I don't think we're buying any new office buildings and any sub-institutional multifamily assets. So go spend the time to do that and um, learn it and figure it out and I'll run our stuff and obviously we're talking every day. Um, and then it, it took about six months to sort of understand all the pieces and the players and how it all worked um, until we started bidding on assets. Uh, and then we started bidding on assets in the fall of 2020. Um, and we found the city of Anaheim who was amenable to the program. Uh, and those were the first two assets we closed in February of 2021. It was about 786 units. Um, and we were able to uh, tie them up, um, get through the city process, and then uh, work with our bond underwriters to go sell those bonds and close on those assets. And then the rest is history. The rest is history, going. correct. But I think, wow. you know, for anybody watching this, I think, you know, we had good institutional experience from our other product types, mm -hmm. but most importantly, with multifamily, you know, you can scale multifamily because 
while there's differences between a 400 unit deal and a 20 unit deal, I would actually argue there's some things that are easier about larger multifamily assets than there are smaller because you can get the economies of scale. More importantly, apartments are apartments. And why a tenant leases a 20 unit apartment or why they lease in a 400 unit apartment, there's a lot of similarities. And so I think you know it wasn't maybe as hard to scale. Um, I like to think maybe we were just you know, had blind faith that it wouldn't be. Um, but we never looked at it as hard because we said we really felt our training and experience, you know, acquiring almost 600 units of substitutional multifamily assets, you know, on a lot of different projects. It really allowed us to understand, you know, rehabbing a, a, an apartment unit is rehabbing an apartment unit, whether it's in a 400 unit building or 20 unit building. Um, understanding what goes into a multifamily project is the similar. So for us, I think we felt like we, uh, had played in that space so long, have built up a really good team that we were ready, you know, uh, to take on larger assets. Talk about the team. Yeah. So you just took on 4,000 yeah. apartment units. Yeah. You most likely didn't have a team. No, yeah, we've had to scale. Correct, so, yeah. So talk through some of the growing pains, if you will, how you built your team out, you know, what that process was like over the past few months. Well, you know, we've had to hire more people, right? We've had to grow our staff, which, you know, in this COVID environment, has been somewhat difficult because of you know people wanting to work from home and virtual right it can be harder to scale but we've been really really fortunate through a lot of our relationships that we've had that we've reached out to to find some really high quality people who have joined Waterford. Um, well, actually, one of the nice parts about buying some of these larger assets is we've had the the luxury of being able to hire people and staff, uh, which has been nice. So we haven't had to do everything ourselves because we had a really small team for a long time. So we brought on board some really, really strong, talented people to help us with our growth. Um, and you know, we've brought in people who've really believed in the mission of Waterford. Um, I think people believe in the mission of providing you know, more affordable housing to people, uh, especially in the workforce space, because I think that's an issue in California. Um, and I think that you know, housing is a really cool property type to be in. Um, I can't tell you the, you know, the the pride that I feel that, you know, in some of our first assets where we'd have a project and I remember taking my young daughter on a Saturday or Sunday to go tour some of our assets and you'd see, you know, people, our residents using the barbecue that we built and enjoying themselves uh, and really having a, a, a good quality experience. And that gives you a lot of pride knowing you're providing quality housing to people. And so I think people have believed in that and uh, have really have, have liked the fact that we're a gr growing company. So uh, it's been really, really, Great to see. It's obviously, you know, in this labor environment, getting harder mm -hmm. uh, to find good quality people. People have a lot of options right now, um, but we've been really, really fortunate to be able to grow and have some really good strategic partners that have helped us in that growth. So when it was the Waterford 1.0, yes, the Valley Ad Shop, yes. How did the team look? What was it? <laughs> it was uh, it was really myself, Sean. We had Phil Christian, who was our head of construction and yeah. asset management. Uh, we had an outside bookkeeper, Melanie. Uh, we had Yushar who joined our team. Um, we had a great construction management firm, American Builders. Um, that was about it. And yeah. so we were, you know, I, I like to joke, we were, you know, doing it, sort of everything, right? Wearing a lot of different hats. Um, and I think when you're entrepreneurial, you have to be. I mean, I remember when we moved from our first office to our second office. Um, when I say we moved, we literally moved. And I remember uh, we were moving, you know, things up the stairs. Because uh, the office space we leased didn't have an elevator, and we had to move filing cabinets upstairs. And Sean and myself and Phil were laughing. We're like, "Oh, the you know the the benefits of being an entrepreneur, right? And that there's a lot of that stuff that people don't see. Having to you know call Cox Cable to get your phone lines and internet set up. There was a lot of that. So we we had to wear a lot of different hats. Uh, I think we've been tr really trying to be mindful of technology, leveraging technology, whether it's online investor relations, uh, things that we can do to uh, you know, leverage technology to our advantage, things like investor relations and things of that like. But you know, it's, it's, it's been a lot of us having to do a lot of work, rolling up your sleeves. And I think if you're gonna do something entrepreneurial, you, you can't be afraid to wear a lot of different hats and do things that are, um, you know, I, I would call it unglamorous, yeah. you know, or not glamorous, I should say, but just have to get done. Right, seems like there's a lot of folks you know, myself included, where you were trying to build something. Yes. And you do the entrepreneurial stuff and you hit some plateaus along yes. the way and then you've got to build out a good team. Yes. To help grow yes. Through that. 
and you guys have done that, you know, twice. And it was really hard to imagine you've done that through COVID on yes. your, your 2.0. Yes. So talk to us about once you got into 2.0, what were your first net? next sets of hires like did you get a controller we got a con I, I think one of the the key hires we made uh was we got a controller who has been jeremy who's been fantastic for us uh and is really you know having him as a part of our team you know really allows us to be nails on the reporting really running our business more efficiently um, we hired uh, a director of acquisitions which allows us to scale more look at more opportunities we hired an associate who's really a, kind of a lead analyst for us. Again, allows us to look at more opportunities. We just hired, um, we have an office manager who's great. Uh, we hired uh, a new senior accountant who again, allows us to scale. Um, we just hired a director of development uh, who we're really excited about because we really see you know, a lot of infill development opportunities in Southern California on the multifamily side. Um, and you know that's been a benefit, I think, uh, that we've seen from a, a city perspective is we've seen cities recognizing we're in a housing crisis in Southern California. And the only way out of it is, you know, one of the chief ways out of it is new supply. Uh, and that's really the, the major thing that needs to happen. And it's nice now, I'm not saying it's easy to entitle projects in Southern California, but it is nice where it's slightly easier. And, and cities are more willing to recognize that. Uh, they have to do things to add new supply and the state of California is doing things to really push on that So we're really excited about that, but you realize that you've just got to scale bring in the right people uh, And be able to scale your business so you continue to to grow and not You know a big part for us is realizing we can't do everything on our own anymore So what's the future hold for Waterford say in 22 23? Is there a 3.0? Yeah, no, I don't know. I, I, I mean, certainly, I think we're going to try to stay as active as possible in this workforce essential housing space because we think there's a real need for that. Uh, we think there's a lot of liquidity for that. Um, I think development is something that we're going to be actively pursuing uh, in finding development projects and uh, taking projects ground up development. So I think that's a big will be a big focus for us. I think we still see opportunity, uh, you know, acquiring retail assets where we think there's redevelopment opportunity. So I think we'll still still stay active in that, um, and so that's what I would I, I would say. I mean, we we're you know sort of knock on wood, the capital markets uh, are really uh, you know flush right now. Uh, there's a lot of liquidity, both you know for you know equity or debt, and so um, you know uh, and certainly the the markets, especially on the multifamily side, are performing really well. Rent growths up, occupancies are very high. So you know the the immediate future feels very good for our business. Um, and, you know, we continue and, and plan to stay very active. Well, you definitely got your hands full. Yeah. There's a lot of folks out there that are looking to carve out a niche for themselves. Yep. Just as you've done, yep. it, it might be hard to repeat exactly yeah. what you did, but, you know, what opportunities do you see out in the market? I mean, I see where mm -hmm. you're going, but mm -hmm. do you see any other opportunities where there might be a niche to carve out, or do you still feel that Value add apartment investing is still a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. I know there's I, I, a lot of people that want to build. You know, yeah, of course. A of their own. Yeah, and you know it's just hard to see what's out there. Well, I mean, I think if you if you think about it, I yeah. think the the benefit is there were a lot of multifamily assets, specifically in Southern California, built in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. right? Um, we always joke. I think every project we bought was built in either 1961, 62, or 63. Yeah. And so with that, you have a tremendous amount of these properties that are, are in need of a capital investment and are in need of improvement. Uh, that's just the nature of real estate. Real estate doesn't fix itself. So I think there will always be a need. Um, and I think that there will always be opportunities for that. And I think it's really, for anybody out there, I think it's really about finding those markets where you see something before somebody else does, where you think you can see people moving in, you see a value proposition. Uh, you see a market where more people are moving in that are moving out. Um, and I think if you look at where vacancy rates are in many areas of, of you know, Southern California, I think they're very low, right? I actually think in some of the urban areas that have been, you know, pretty hurt by COVID, uh, I could see opportunities there because I think in some ways maybe they're getting oversold a little bit, a little but, but a little soft. But I think one benefit of Southern California we're going to have is I, I don't, you know, even though you see, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there about population loss, you know, we're still a very, there's a lot of benefits of being in Southern California. There's still a lot of people who want to be here. So I, I will always believe that there are opportunities 
uh, and somebody who wants to do something more entrepreneurial, there will always be that opportunity to acquire that first 14 unit project. Yep. I think what we learned from our experiences is, is really focus on areas, right? Really learn an area, learn a submarket that you really believe in and that you really think has room for growth. Um, if we look at the lexicon of projects that we bought, you know, some where we maybe you know made some mistakes was that we believed there was growth when there really wasn't going to be there, um, and so it's really about finding those, uh, and it's about doing it right. I, I, I think if there's the biggest piece of advice is is set a strategy, start small. I think we're a perfect example of just because you start small doesn't mean you have to end small, but start small, focus on a project, and then go up and tie up a project and go try it, and uh, and even if that's an eight unit, four unit project. Right. Just go do it. No, that's really good value. What about picking a partner? Yeah. Somebody out there that's, you know, can't do it all themselves, yep. wants to find a partner. Yep. What's your recommendations for finding a good partner? Because you did. You yes. Did aligned and then one plus one equals seven. Yeah. It's, I, I think a partnership is a marriage. So you have to be very aware of going into a partnership is a marriage. And, um, you know, just like a marriage, you know, if something were to happen with it, it could be very messy. So you better go in picking the right partner. I think where I feel very fortunate is Sean and I came into our partnership out of mutual respect uh, and out really of us believing that we had, you know, there was a lot of synergies with us working together and we were very complimentary to each other and it wasn't forced. Uh, and I like to say, you know, we shared office space for about nine months before we tied up our first project and 11 months in we closed our first project. And in many ways, uh, you know, we sort of dated before we got married because we saw work styles, we, we talked about things, and we didn't go full partnership right away. But uh, it's been a great partnership because we've allowed to complement each other. And I think it's allowed us to scale faster. Um, but again, if you're going to be partners with somebody, you better know going in it's a marriage and that you're going to be tied at the hip with somebody. Uh, and that it, it better have a lot of synergies and be very complimentary. So you, you've got to spend a lot of time up front talking, talking through scenarios, making sure that interests are aligned. You know, Sean and I are very similar ages. We're in very similar points in our life. Uh, and so I think all those things are really, really important to talk about um, because it's, it's difficult if, you know, there, if there are partnership breakups, right? So you want to make sure that everything's aligned well. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, you guys have done a lot just in the past six years, yeah. six, seven years. It's going to be great to see what you guys do yeah. in the next six or seven years. Yeah, we're excited. Yeah. I just saw your recent LinkedIn post where you guys just eclipsed uh, two billion yeah. acquisitions just yeah. in 2021 yeah. in multifamily acquisitions. So you guys have done a lot. You definitely provided a lot of really good value. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, no problem. And I, and I think, again, the, the big thing for me, if anybody watching this thinks about doing something entrepreneurial, you know, setting a plan. Um, you know, being smart about that plan, but it's again taking that first leap. Buy that first four-unit deal. Buy that first eight-unit deal. You probably will not have all the answers. You might have to go hard on a de deposit that's very meaningful, and you might not have your equity and your debt everything perfectly lined up. But don't let that dissuade you. I think I see a lot of people who uh, talk a lot about it, but don't necessarily do a lot about it, and don't take that first step. And if I could give any advice, it's it's go out and, and do your research and do your homework, but then at some point you're gonna have to you know, take that leap. And again, everything might not be perfect, but that's okay, but you have to take the leap. And you have to go buy that first deal and try it, and then your course correct, and then you'll learn from it. And I think if you look at our background and experience, where we really pride ourselves is not making the same mistake twice and learning from all our experiences, uh, and I think that's you know, critically important. Well, you've done a great job doing it. This is a ton of value. It gives me a lot to think about. A lot of the viewers have got a lot to think about. This was gold. We really Good. appreciate it. Of course, well, my pleasure. Being here. Yeah, of course, my Hopefully pleasure. We'll have you back with an update. I, I, I'd, love <laughs> I'd love to be back. I'd love to be back. Sounds good. Thank right. you. You got it. Thanks.